So I'm going to start with the uh, open meeting protocol. Uh, my name is Charlie Fosca, Chair of the Finance Committee. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on agenda are on the agenda. This meeting is being recorded. And can hear me. Uh, when I call your name, uh, please uh, answer uh, that uh, in the affirmative if you're, if you're present. Grant Gibbion? Shane Blundell? Here. John Ellis? Here. Uh, Mary Margaret Fr Car Carolyn White? <laughs> Mary Margaret Franklemont. I'm here. Arif Padaria. Arif. Jonathan Wallach. Here. And Arif is here. He's just. I know he is. I saw him. Right. Brian Beck. Peter Howard. Here. Shailene Pokris. Daryl Harmer. John Deist. Probably John Deist, you're there. there. Alan Sorry, Jones. Alan. Yeah, I'm yes. here. Annie LaCourt. Here. Bill Keller. Alan Tosti. Here. George Koser. Here. Christine Deschler. Here. Dean Carmen. Here. And David McKenna. Here. Let me just try um, Carolyn White, Ryan Beck, Shailene Pokris, Bill Keller. Okay, no answers on those. Thank you very much. We have a quorum. Is, is Alan Jones here? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, also anticipated speakers tonight, we have Adam Chaplain, Sandy Pooler, and possibly Julie Wayman. The open meeting of the Arlington Finance Committee is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's order 12 of uh, March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we've been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings, and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law. Uh, to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of the public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely, so long as reasonable public access is afforded, so the public can follow along with deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment only in writing by email to uh, Liz Diggins at town.arlington.ma.us uh, or in her absence to cfoskett at town.arlington.ma.us.com. Uh, .us. For this meeting, the Finance Committee is convening by Zoom app as posted on the town meeting website, identifying how the public may join and comment. Please note that the meeting is being recorded and some attendees are participating via video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and, that, and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supporting materials have been provided that have been provided to this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public's encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless the chair notes otherwise. Uh, the chair will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members inviting them to provide any comments, questions, or motions. Please hold it until your name is called further. Please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking, and please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage politically with other members, please do so the through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. Finally, each vote in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. Thank you very much. Okay, so. Charlie, it's Daryl. I'm here. Thank you, Daryl. Got that, Peter? Yes. So, and, um, and, and Brian Vector showed up too. Oh, good. Hi, Brian. So, um, again, a, a call for budgets if you haven't got your budgets in, uh, and please be sure to put them in the calendar or send them to Liz so that uh, she, she'll know that they're available. Um, There'll be no meeting on March 24th. Uh, Vision, uh, Envision Arlington is having a town meeting candidates night and um, 
we thought that uh, a lot of uh, finance committee members who also might be town meeting members might want to attend that meeting. meeting. Um, I, I'd like to make a couple of comments about um, department review decorum. So uh, I, I've had some feedback that um, some uh, members of the town uh, management team and department managers, et cetera, have felt at, a, at one or two uh, FinCom review meetings that, that, the, um, that their work was taken uh, with less than um, the degree of seriousness which uh, it deserves. So I'm uh, just mentioning this. Uh, I have to say that it's um, vague and um, uh, vague in general comments, and you know, not not well substantiated. But nonetheless, it it does concern me. Uh, I think we have to remember that these various uh, department managers um, are professionals. They're seriously engaged in their business. They're trying to do a good job, and. Uh, no matter what circumstances we might find them in or what circumstances we might view their budgets, uh, we still have to continue uh, a relationship with them. We should treat them with the utmost of um, gravitas and um, respect. So um, I just wanted to pass that thought along so that we can be sure that we're, when we advance on their budgets, that we do so uh, with appropriate amount of seriousness. Uh, the next item on the agenda, uh, minutes, Peter. Uh, I I asked Liz to circulate the minutes on uh, Thursday, but as far as I can make out, she didn't do it. So nobody's okay. got a chance to look at them. All right. I'm glad you confirmed that because I thought I was delinquent. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what can I have done with those minutes? <laughs> okay. So um, the, the, um, the, the next formal item on the agenda, since I expected that this was going to take a little bit longer, is the uh, town manager. But I don't know if the town manager, uh, I think they're going to come at 8 o'clock. So maybe we can just jump to uh, some budgets at, at this point. Um, we, at the last meeting, we were in the middle of the uh, DPW budgets. Maybe I'll just digress for a moment. I sent a memo out today um, to, uh, to everyone. And um, uh, basically following some comments that Christine made two weeks ago, three weeks ago, about the difference between actuals and uh, the fiscal 20 actuals and the uh, uh, 21 and 22 budgets. And also some of the conversation that we were having uh, at the last meeting, um, <clears throat> I went through the the um, a spreadsheet that's on our on our uh, SharePoint site and compared the departments uh, budgets from fiscal year 20 actuals and the two uh, budgeted 21 and 22 columns. And uh, so I summarized that in the in the memo. And I eliminated, I didn't include any of the schools in the pension funds and I eliminated snow and ice. The pension and, and the insurance I eliminated because they're sort of personnel related. I didn't include any salaries and I eliminated snow, snow and ice because it's somewhat controlled by factors really outside the direct control of the town. The balance of the expense budgets are, are the ones that most of you have been looking at at various times. And um, what I found was that there was a 24% on, in, in, a, in a weighted sense, on, on, in an average weighting, there was a 24% difference between the fiscal 20 actual budgets and the, fisc and the uh, fiscal 21, I'm sorry, let me say that again, between the fiscal 20 actual expenses and the fiscal 21 budgets. The fiscal 21 budget and the fiscal 22 budgets are pretty much pretty close together, so there's not much of a difference there. But they're they're both budgeted columns, not actuals. So, um, I guess the first thing I concluded was that the the observations that uh, Christine Dexler made were, you know, a reasonable reasonable observation to make. Uh, I don't know why all these budgets have these differences. I didn't go back and look at every single one and try to explain it. I figured that since you're all going to be looking at them, um, 
you know, you, you'll have the opportunity to dig into those details. Um, <clears throat> I did discuss these with Alan Jones because I was, I wanted uh, our uh, computer expert to check them out and make sure I wasn't messing anything up. And um, he, he actually went back and did some further analysis. I, I, I don't know, do you want to comment on your CAPRA work, Alan? Uh, I, I, I took a hint from Dean and I uh, went into the uh, FY20 audited CAFRs where they have uh, the, you know, the actual expenses for FY20. Now they do include the salaries, so it's a really different set of data. And what I found going through all the departments is that there uh, is a variation from department to department but if you look at the whole budget uh, as, as a total, it was only about a 1% uh, variance. Uh, one thing I did notice in, in the audit, there's the, the actuals for FY20, and then there's a carry forward column that is probably money that was encumbered in FY20, but probably not spent till 21. But in most cases, the FY20 actual without the carry forward is what matched the FY20 actuals in the budget book. So I'm not exactly sure how they book the carry forwards, but it looks like in the budget book, they're using the, 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 the they call it the cash accounting for FY20. And may, maybe, uh, uh, you know, our Dean can uh, uh, elaborate on that, but um Bottom line is I didn't see, including the salaries, I didn't see any massive over budgeting. Um, but again, that included salaries. So the, the expenses are a relatively small percentage of the entire budgets. So, I'm happy to send that spreadsheet. Yeah, out so to so I'm, I'm perplexed why the actuals, that we, the numbers that we get as actuals have such a difference with respect to the, to the budgets. I, that's still, an, in my mind, an unanswered question. Right. But you're and, looking at the expense part of it. And so expenses only, not the Where, salaries. Whereas I add, I, I, the, the, the audit includes expenses and salaries. Yeah. And the salaries really swamp any variations in the expense. Probably. Yeah. So, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting here that there's anything nefarious afoot. Right. I'm just trying to understand what the basis is against which we're supposed to be measuring things. And I'm, and I'm concerned about the differences. So yeah, but I think it deserves some, you know, questions and explanations, maybe from the, the manager's office and the comptroller's office, just so we understand where the numbers come from and, you know, what their meanings are. Uh, Dean, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Being our resident, uh, no, he summarized one of our it well. Resident CPAs. No, I think Alan summarized it well. Okay. Okay. Um, so while we're waiting for uh, the manager and deputy town manager to, to uh, uh, come aboard, uh, Christine, can I suggest we pick up on the DPW budgets? We could, but we'll be interrupted if it, 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 at eight. I don't know if you just want to do other budgets, smaller budgets, or go back into DPW knowing that we'd have to stop again. Well, we aren't there subsections? Yeah. Mr. Chair, we haven't voted on the uh, CPA committee yet. You're right. Um, here comes Sandy and well, Adam. Sandy and Adam are here. Okay. Hello, Adam. Hi, Sandy. Hey, Charlie. Okay, we're rescued hey, by the bell. I, I told the select board that uh, a very important committee was waiting for me, so they wrapped it up quick. <laughs> okay. Well, <clears throat> good. So, uh, Peter, uh, the record should show that uh, Adam and Sandy here. Is, is Julie going to join us tonight or not? I, I didn't know when. She will. Okay. In fact, oh, she's she, she just arrived. She's here and just turned right. her screen. Okay, camera. great. Hi, Julie. So, um, so uh, the, the manager and deputy town manager have received some uh, questions from various um, uh, corners of the finance committee, including um, we're looking for some explanation on the 
Health and Human Services budget, the IT budget, and possibly we had some questions from last week on the DPW budget. And uh, we were also going to discuss um, article, uh, I think I'm trying to remember now which in the two warrants, which it was, but this article on transportation. And then Sandy might make some comments on the, the remote meetings article. Uh, and then I don't know if um, there will there'll be any remarks on the expense budgets and generals that we were just uh, speaking about. So um, let me turn the uh, meeting over to the town manager and deputy town manager. So um, maybe per perhaps the the easier one for me to start with, I think it was Article 73, the one in regards to the Uber and Lyft uh, transportation fees. I might have that number wrong. Is that uh, okay with you, Mr. Chair? Yes, uh, it is. Let me see. I'm, I, I'm not sure which, um, to be honest, which numbering system we're dealing with, but. Is that the co-transportation one? Is that what you're talking about? Yes, it's the, the $39,000 uh, yes. specific amount. That's 60. We haven't talked about that yet. So. Yeah, no, we, well, because we wanted to get some information from the town manager, and that right. was Article 65, 39,153. Yes, that's the one. That's the one. Yep. Um, so that is, uh, that, that's a very specific sum of money for a specific reason. Um, several years ago, the state, passed uh, a new fee on what they call transportation network companies. And per that statute, uh, they created a transportation network division of the Department of Public Utilities that collects a 20 cent uh, or a, yeah, 20 cent ride per assessment on all TNC rides originating in Massachusetts. So TNC, you'll pre you predominantly are familiar with as Uber or Lyft or services like Uber or Lyft. So each year, half of the per ride assessment is dispersed to each municipality based on the number of rides originating in that municipality. And the funds, again, statutorily, must be used to address the impact of transportation network services on municipal roads, bridges, and other transportation infrastructure or any other public purpose substantially related to the operation of transportation network services in the city or town, including, but not limited to, the complete streets program established in general law and other programs that support alternative modes of transportation. So we, we have to, we can only spend those monies basically on transportation related matters or, or infrastructure. The first year we received these funds, uh, we put, um, we put the monies towards the implementation of the permanent bus rapid transit lane in East Arlington. The second year that we received these funds, we put them towards the sidewalk replacement project in Arlington Center. And this year, we plan to ask for the allocation of these funds for continuing sidewalk work in Arlington Center and other accessibility work uh, on sidewalks throughout town. So we're trying to keep in <clears throat> sort of keep keep it necessarily off off the roadways as a, as there's a highlight for alternative modes of transportation. So I think what what we'd be asking for the committee um, for favorable action by the committee would be uh, to endorse or approve the expenditure of those funds uh, on again sidewalk improvements and accessibility improvements in town. Uh, any question for the manager? Any questions for the manager, I should say? Trying to. Yes. Peter. Uh, Adam, are, are those funds in hand? Are they from last year? The ones that you're. Uh, yes. Yeah, so the, these are actually, there, there's a pretty significant lag. The, the, the $39,000 amount is from uh, revenue collected in 2019. So yes, they, they, they are in fact in hand already. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other uh, questions on this matter? Okay, we'll uh, we'll take a vote on that at, at the end of the meeting so we don't hold people up with these roll call votes. 
Okay. Um, so then the, the uh, second um, subject that uh, caused some questions uh, in general were the, uh, was the growth in the health and human services budget from fiscal year 20 to fiscal year 21 to fiscal year 22. And um, I believe the, the aggregate growth was something like $172,000. Uh, the the growth in then there was a new department um, created, and uh, the growth in the new department was between the budget of fiscal twenty one and and twenty two was thirty thousand dollars, principally in expenses. And um, there are some related questions about two new employees, um, or two new positions, I should say, that were. Um, allegedly or, or potentially covered by COVID-related expenses, but maybe we're not. I don't. I don't know where we where we actually wound up on that. Mary Margaret, have I said that correctly? Um, I don't. I think that we wanted to make sure that those two people were um, that we had more hours for people because of COVID for the people who'd be working in public health. Um, but there were a number of questions. Um, about, well, the, the diversity one, but also um, I think that I answered most of the questions about health and human services, but um, there was one question about the two vacant positions that were gonna be, those people will be rehired at, the, at a lower rate. We discussed that. Um, Well, I, I could take a crack at some of that. Go right ahead. Like. So to, to start with the two uh, health agent positions uh, that are in question. Uh, so we use utilizing CARES Act money. That was the first round of federal support that was passed back in calendar year 2020 uh, in response to the pandemic. Uh, we created and or paid for out of the CARES Act two health agent positions. Uh, significantly focused on uh, contact tracing, uh, now focused on both contact tracing and working as part of our local vaccination efforts. CARES Act monies were initially only uh, allowed to be utilized until December 30th, 2020, kind of weird that it wasn't the 31st, but December 30th, 2020. However, subsequent action uh, by the federal government pushed that date till December 31st, 2021. So what we've proposed in our FY22 budget is for those two health agent positions to remain, to be funded by CARES Act money through December 31st, 2021. So through the first half of uh, FY22, and then for the general fund to pick up those positions for the remainder of FY22. So from January 1 until June 30 uh, of calendar year 22, uh, up until the end of fiscal year 22. We would only continue to utilize those positions if the circumstances of the pandemic required it. Uh, we've, we've maintained those positions in the budget utilizing both CARES Act and general fund money to be sure that we have adequate resources to get us through whatever remains in this pandemic. Uh, I fully acknowledge sitting here tonight, things are looking much better. Um, rates of vaccination are increasing, rates of transmission are going down. Uh, but uh, I'm not myself fully ready to say that um, you know that we're, that we're through with the hard work that the health department's been doing uh, over the course of the past year plus. So I, I think what we've really done is, is try to put in place a budget that makes sure we have the resources that we might need uh, if if variants were to get out of control or unexpectedly there was to be another surge and the work continued. Um, I, I think what I would have to say is I'm, I'm giving you the assurance that, I'm trying to give you the assurance that as the pandemic ebbs, we will start to move back down towards uh, the prior level of staffing for health agents, for those, for those that type of position in the health department. So I don't know if you want me to stop there and see if there's yeah, any questions. Uh, any questions, questions on that subject? Mr. Chairman? Al. Could the uh, 
the new money, which supposedly is coming towards us, uh, be used for the second half of uh, fiscal 22 for those two positions also? Or do we know that? We don't know for sure yet. Uh, there's a chance that could be allowed. The, the language uh, in the, the American Rescue Act talks about uh, premium pay or premium time pay for those responding to the pandemic. So I think that's speaking to either stipended work or potentially um, overtime work. I, I'm not sure that we'll be allowed to use it for direct salary expenditures. If we if we are, uh, I, I you know I'd want to talk about it with Sandy, but I would almost guarantee that we would try to do that. Uh, but I think we're we're in a little bit of a waiting game. Hopefully, in the next week or so, we'll see the more detailed regulations from the Department of Treasury telling us exactly how we can utilize those funds. So, uh, any other questions for Adam? Looking for hands. Um, I have. I'm sorry. I have a question. Go right ahead, Mary. I mean, not a question. It was more. Um, that I and I think I told you this when I talked to you last that um, those two positions were also working or the two positions we had already were uh, were working more hours and that's part of why this, there's some salary difference because they're working more hours than in previous years and again like Adam said let's hope we don't have to continue using them that many hours. Mary, Mary Margaret, are they working more hours or do we have less grant money that are paying for hours? Um, they're definitely working more hours. And I think she's, and she probably is using all the grant money first that she can, but I got the impression that they, in, in addition to that, they were working because they were, it's new people and the grants can somewhat pay for that, but the existing people we had were working more hours than they would have in a normal year. So. That's accurate. So, so Adam, you're, you're, you, I think I heard you say that uh, after December 31st, if there's no further, um, requirement from the pandemic that these positions will um, be dissolved. Is that correct? I, yes, that's correct. If we're not contact tracing, if we're not still doing some form of mass vaccination, uh, we, we would look we would look to eliminate those positions. So they're, not, they're not part of a permanent growth in the personnel staffing? The plan is not to have permanent, no, agreed. The, the plan was not to permanently grow the base of the health department. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Al. Okay, there's three other positions. One is the public health nurse that's grown from 38 to 64. And then we have the new uh, over uh, offsets. And then there's the sewer of weights and measures, which is more than double. And then we have the program coordinator for AYX. SC um, that's gone up by about 20,000. How much of this is taken up with the offsets down below? In other words, are they just broken out and put in the offsets for more transparency? Uh, or are there really growth in those hours and why, especially the CR voice and measures? So I think S Sandy's prepared to answer that. Go ahead, Sandy. Uh, I'm going to start with the public health nurse. If you look at the offsets below, there's $26,470 that are offsets uh, that come uh, from the Medical uh, Reserve Corps funding. Um, so it is, as Mr. Tosti said, just a matter of trying to be more transparent. Um, the public health nurse always worked those hours, um, and we in the past had only shown the general fund portion, but now we're trying to show all portions of uh, where that nurse's funding is coming from. Uh, and then the sealer, in a similar fashion, the sealer, uh, just give me one second to... The sealer is shared between several towns, right? Correct, correct. And um, 
we increased uh, the sealers, uh, well, we've offset $12,302 from the sealers uh, salary in this budget. Uh, so that makes up pretty much all, all the difference between what was budgeted last year and um, what's being budgeted this year. Again, it's a transparency attempt that obviously wasn't transparent enough. No good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> I'm learning that lesson over and over again. And, and the third position um, was, the, was the AYCC program coordinator. AYCC program coordinator. I think it's AYHSC. Oh. I'm sorry, AY. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, Oh, I see. Program coordinator. Yes, just a second, please. Um, that one, uh, there is $20,000, $20,176 uh, that, uh, again, is an offset. Um, again, somebody whose hours weren't changed, but whose uh, funding source is just made more explicit. Thank you. Christine, did you have any more questions? I have a question on an expense item. I don't know if you want to move to that. Um, maybe we could just deal with the, um, the personnel for a moment. That's uh, fine. So keep your hand up. Shane? <laughs> I, I, thanks, Charlie. It's sort of a personnel question, but more about CARES Act. Um, so we have like the CARES Act, we have a second tranche of money coming. Do we expect that we will use all of the money available under the CARES Act? And if not, are we thinking about ways that we could redeploy it to offset general fund expenses? Um, Does that make sense? Andy, go ahead. I could, uh, thank you. So um, we have to do extensive filings with CARES Act. Uh, originally we were, eligible for about $4 million in costs. Um, we have still on the table uh, that we haven't filed for, um, and we could potentially add, if we identified the right cost, about $600,000 at this point. Um, so we do keep looking at it. Uh, and uh, if there are other costs, we will try to file for as much as that 4 million as we can. Um, that's just where we stand today. And we have a whole year to continue to identify those costs um, and continue to fund. Thank you. Alan? Uh, I, I, I have caught, uh, questions about the expenses, maybe the same as Christine. Okay, so Christine. The 37,000 um, contracted services expense. Can you, can you just clarify what that is for? Is, is it, are we now carrying it because a grant, we, we lost a grant? Did we ever pay that money, pay those expenses from general funds rather than a grant? Can you just t tell me more about that? It, it is because we lost a grant. It's money that we pay to the Somerville Homeless Coalition for their services uh, for, uh, for homeless and, and uh, other people. Um, both, I mean, I've, as I learn more about it, and Adam probably knows better than I, but there are homeless people throughout uh, Arlington, uh, both uh, kind of down by route. Uh, two there in the woods, but uh, throughout town. Um, and so we use Somerville Co Homeless Coalition fairly extensively. We used to um, get grant money that covered our share for paying Somerville Homeless, but um, that grant stopped rather suddenly. And so now we are picking up the tab for, for the, the, those, excuse me, those services. Adam, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I, I mean, I would just add that the, what those services are, are the, the hours of outreach workers that work for the Somerville Homeless Coalition that partner with the health department and the police department in providing services and referrals to 
pr primarily the homeless population that's currently living in the Mugar Woods. Um, they have encamped in other parts of town before, and there are uh, a smaller number of homeless people in other parts of town, but the service is primarily focused on those currently uh, encamped in the Mugar Woods. Did we, did we, did we utilize those services without a grant before? I mean, in other words, we got grant money to provide these services and we've been using grant money. Now the grant money has dried up, right? But prior to the grant money, was any part of that already in, in, a, in this budget or in any budget of the town to provide those services? In other words, I guess what I'm asking is, are we now paying out of the general fund ex for expenses that were until now always covered by a grant, which raises the question, should we still continue to provide those services when the grant money dries up? So I, I think the, the, the answer is, um, I think how to answer this. So we all, we've for a long time have utilized town time to provide some level of these services, but had previously only ever had access to Somerville Homeless Coalition services via the grant. So from that point of view, yes, this is the first time we're asking for town resources to pay, town tax dollars to pay for services rendered by the Somerville Homeless Coalition. Sandy, were you gonna add something there? No, I was gonna to speak just to, to, to the money question, but um, I think Adam has been much more involved with uh, kind of the day-to-day -day or overseeing the services that go on between the police and, and HHS, which I think goes to the issue of why these issues are important. I think we've just done so, a lot of work with the, with the people, uh, with the homeless in town, and I think have tried to keep them safe and keep the rest of the public safe. Um, so I think they are important services. So I, mean, I, I, I wanted to ask you, Adam, if you could elaborate on the types of services that the Somerville Homeless Coalition provides to the town uh, for these homeless people. So it, it's predominantly social work services, uh, both in terms of direct social work um, with the, those living uh, in the Mugar Woods, as well as referrals to services for different levels of potential mental health treatment or substance use treatment. And I think perhaps most importantly, it's uh, referrals and even assistance with filling out applications for access to housing, whether it be uh, either temporary or permanent housing. I mean, ultimately, our goal in doing this work is to house the individuals that are living in the Mugar Woods. Uh, we were successful, again, via a grant source, I believe last year, in housing eight individuals that are still housed. Um, the, the challenge is with homelessness growing in the region, uh, this has become an attractive spot for people uh, to come and take up residence. So. We've, we've had success in housing people, but there's still more people residing in the woods. Uh, ultimately, like what we'd like to do is find either other grant resources, um, potentially state or federal level sources. We're also pushing the MUGARs uh, to, to date to no avail to help us. But ultimately, we do this right. The goal would be to provide housing to those living here, living there today, and then to find the right steps to take um, so that that space is no longer uh, as welcoming a place for uh, the homeless to encamp. <clears throat> encamp, excuse me. Thank you, uh, Arif. No, Jonathan. I thought I saw Arif's hand up, but Jonathan. Jonathan, yeah, 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 sorry. I was just uh, trying to multitask here unsuccessfully. Um, Adam. Um, would we be able to use any of the American Rescue Plan Act funds for these purposes? So I think the, the answer is similar to the answer I gave to Al about the health agents in that um, maybe, um, and it looks like there could be one of the criteria that would allow us to. Uh, and if we were able to use some of the Rescue Act funds, I think we would. 
uh, both for these services that we're talking about. We could uh, potentially have a conversation about paying for it out of Rescue Act funds as opposed to the general fund. I'm also hopeful that we might be able to utilize some of the Rescue Act monies uh, to find either temporary or permanent housing for the people living uh, down in the Mugar Woods. So oh, I, I and, think there are I think there are possibilities there, John. And what about rent relief? I think as, as I read again, the four general criteria I think looking at rent and relief will be a possibility as well. Very good, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, any, any other questions on, um, on the health and human services budget for? Annie oh, has Alan Tossi, you have your hand up? Yeah, just quickly, uh, could, could the, if the uh, property transfer tax, I think that's what it's called, which is on the warrant for this year, if that passes, would that those funds be eligible to use for this purpose or related purpose? You know, honestly, Alf, I'd have to double check on that to be sure. Um, I, I know that they certainly are intended to be used for affordable housing. Um, whether or not they could be used for homelessness prevention or services, I'm not. I'm not positive. I could look into that. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. So, Chairman, uh, Annie LaCourt has her hand raised as well. Yeah, Annie. Um, so Adam, so we've housed eight people. Um, do you have any idea what the census is of folks that are still falling in that catchment area? The last I heard was about 10 people. Okay. And um, I, I know Christine would probably be able to say off the top of her head, but... Um, Perhaps you could mention how hard it is to house someone who's a member of that population and why it costs so much money, because it does cost a lot of money to uh, rehouse someone who is homeless. So I, I'm definitely not expert in those matters, but I, um, both in working with Christine and her team and just by the virtue of the the, the, the work that my wife does at the Pine Street and I have a little sort of just enough information to be dangerous, but um, I, I, the cost is really in that a, a lot of the people living, a lot, a lot of homeless people need some type of supportive housing. Uh, they're not necessarily ready to move into some uh, type of independent living in an apartment. So, some certainly are, and some do um, with limited assistance. Um, but many of these people need either supportive housing or a high level of case management. So it's not just the cost of rent, but the cost of personnel um, to help those people get housed and stay housed. So um, yeah, get, taking someone uh, from the streets and then getting them stabilized and, um, and supportive and then eventually hopefully to more permanent housing uh, can be costly based on that need. They, they need that help to get, to get back to where they need to be. So then let me ask you a quick follow-up question, the theme of which I think you will recognize from our previous emails. Um, wouldn't we be better to invest in more social workers in the town and sort of take the police out of the picture here in terms of dealing with this population and providing them assistance? So, I mean, the, the, this might be a deeper conversation than we, want to get into tonight, but I, it, it's tough, right? I, I do think we can and should think about expanding our ranks of social workers in the Arlington Police Department. Um, but I know firsthand that most, if not all of the social workers that we have working for the town wouldn't go into those woods without a police officer with them. And I don't mean to, to suggest that the people living in there are dangerous. Uh, but there, there are there is there is hesitation or fear with entering the property, especially after hours of dark. So I, I think it's I think I think it, it's a tricky wicket to to work through. I mean, I, I, I'm not I'm not refuting your point, Annie, but I think it's a challenging. I, I think having police involvement in some way is important, but I think your point is well taken at finding ways to enhance our investment in the town's social work capacity would be money well spent. Anything else, Annie? Arif? Yes, yeah, so I have a question following the same line of thought, Adam, is um, uh, maybe Sandy made the comment, but the comment was made that 
it's not only keeping those the homeless safe but it's keeping the town folk safe and so being a resident of the town how do i feel safe how does my kids feel safe um and and i don't mean it in any negative way so let's be very clear what i'm trying to say is if there are homeless people around i don't know what their intents are intention is i have a 14 year old son how do you intend to keep the town safe what are those exact services measures etc maybe it's obvious to everyone else but if you could just classify those or mention them that would be helpful so i mean i think the main effort we undertake is very regular outreach in service to those living uh, in in the mugar woods identifying who they are uh, getting an understanding of whether or not they have any prior criminal history and if there is any reason for us to have immediate concern about dangers they might present to uh, to the general public um, that's that is actually one of the critical roles that officer joe kniff plays uh, with the outreach team is working with them to get identities and, and learn more about the people. Um, if there are people encamping in the woods with outstanding criminal warrants uh, or matters that would need to be addressed by law enforcement, those those would, would be addressed. We, we've been fortunate that the people li living in the woods to date um, haven't had criminal histories of, uh, I, I think, for, I, I can't guarantee no criminal histories, but e either ver either none or a limited criminal history such that concern about past behavior posing a danger to the community would be very low. Um, again, m moving on from that. So we want to know the people who are in there so that we understand what level of security and protection might need to be provided. Moving on from there, um, it, it's not really, a, a, it's not a safe, sanitary or healthy place for them to be living. So we're trying, we're trying to find ways to get them housed. Um, I think ultimately though, if I you know, I can't. I can't promise. I, I can't promise a solution overnight or, or or full safety and security. I mean, I couldn't do that, even absent the presence of homeless people camping in the Mugar Woods. Uh, but I, but I think it, via our via our outreach, we've we, we've scoped the situation as best we can to have an understanding of the risk that it might pose. Okay, thank you. And is this in this is in conjunction with other towns? I guess right, the neighboring towns. Is that correct? Yeah, we, we do keep in regular contact with uh, Cambridge and Belmont, um, at least for this where this population is currently located. Um, in, in past times where people were camping along the AOF Brook closer to Somerville, we worked more closely with the city of Somerville, but right now um, the work is more, um, more tightly with Belmont and Cambridge. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Oh, so Adam, I have a, a related question to the comments that you just made. Suppose that we were very fortunate and we were able, you said, I don't know how many people, let's assume there are 10, 10 individuals living there in the woods. Suppose we were able to get all 10 people housed in Arlington somewhere, okay? My, my question is, is this a regional problem? I mean, are these people coming from Arlington or are they coming from Cambridge and Boston and other locations to that position? So that it, no matter what we do, our success is just going to provide a an avenue of relief to other communities that aren't helping to support this effort. So the, it is most definitely a regional challenge. Um, I, I I don't know offhand the origins of the people currently residing in the woods, whether or not they're from Arlington or, or not, um, it's definitely a regional challenge. My experience um, in terms of the Thorndike area, the Alewife area is, there, I, I've been aware of a homeless population in that area as long as I've worked here. So over the better part of the last decade, um, they, people have lived under the, the overpass. Um, so that goes over the bike, you know, the route to overpass that goes yeah. over the bikeway, sometimes camping by the Alewife Greenway, sometimes camping in the Mugar woods. And the, the reality is um, government action, whether it be state or local government action, um, often has prompted them to move from one location to another, but there has been a seemingly very consistent presence of homeless people living in that area. 
I, I don't know this for sure, but my best educated guess is the red line terminating where it does makes it uh, an attractive location because of transportation access for for these folks. So I I think you are, I mean, part of what we've talked about a lot internally is if we were able to house the people currently camping in the Mugar Woods, um, and hy hypothetically, I, I don't know that we would or could do this, but then we hypothetically fenced the property to make it inaccessible. Sitting here tonight, I'm not convinced that solves the problem. Um, I think there could very well still be um, homeless people who would choose to find a place. You know, it could be just over the border in Cambridge or just over the border in Belmont, or it could be in Arlington. But uh, I do think it is an area, as there is still a regional problem, that people would find attractive um, while homeless. Difficult problem. It is. Any other questions on uh, health and human services for town management? Okay, um, thank you for that, Adam. So I guess the next uh, subject that had some um, some concern um, was the evolution of the uh, DEI position into a DEI department and an apparent increase in expense levels. And um, maybe you could get, let's give us some clarity on on that position. And, and uh, I believe uh, one of the members asked the question, why if we hired a DEI manager to help address the, this whole issue in the town, do we now have to hire a consultant uh, also to address the issue when we, that was, we thought the purpose of hiring the uh, director? So I'll, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll start at the beginning in that um, what it would be effectively too well. Uh, what, back in FY20, uh, in, so in late, late calendar year 2018, we made the decision to create what at that time we call the diversity, equity, and inclusion coordinator position. Um, it was sort of the culmination of a number of years of Christine Bongiorno uh, working with me and uh, the human resources director and Sandy trying to figure out the best way to provide administrative support to the Human Rights Commission, the Disability Commission, and the, um, and the Rainbow Commission. Uh, those decisions also were coming around the same time that we were aware that Jack Jones, the longtime weatherization coordinator, who had been acting as the ADA coordinator um, on a volunteer basis, was planning to retire. So we knew there was a big gap to fill for, um, from, from the ADA coordinator position point of view. And um, in both in town uh, and more broadly, even back in 2018, there was a growing interest in focusing on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we proposed for the FY20 budget to create that position. Um, again, it was at that point a coordinator's position that would be reporting to uh, the Director of Health and Human Services. So that was uh, approved in the FY20 budget. And um, Jill Harvey, was hired, I, I always forget if she started in December of 2029 or January of 2020, but right around that time frame. So right, right in the mid year um, of the FY20 budget. Um, she came on board uh, right away. We were, we'd already planned on starting uh, training for town department heads and supervisory staff on race equity and leadership with the National League of Cities. Um, and it was, not sure after that training that both the pandemic hit and then sadly, not shortly after that, um, that uh, the killing of George Floyd occurred, which obviously um, really ignited this discussion on a national level in terms of uh, race in general and of course, race and policing. So Jill, upon starting, uh, very quickly got up to speed and realized how much appetite there was um, across the three commissions that she was providing staff support to for the work that she was doing, uh, which demonstrated a few things to us that one, um, she was, the, the work she was doing was important enough and, be, and made a priority enough in the organization that making uh, DEI a division of the Health and Human Services Department um, seemed appropriate for us to do. And also the amount of work that she was doing 
uh, sort of, I would say on the, the, the training and organizing and programming level uh, was being overcome by some of the administrative work that she also had to do for, uh, for those boards and committees and commissions. And it was for that reason that we decided mid budget year to provide her with part-time administrative help. Um, <clears throat> so then promoting her to director and again, giving her an administrative assistant. Uh, now going forward into FY22, uh, we've created this division with the director and administrative assistant. Um, we're providing not only uh, continuing internal training to uh, department heads and supervisory staff, but Jill is partnering with Alensa Michelle, who's the, I think the consultant you're referencing, Charlie, to provide a series of racial justice teach-ins to the community as a sort of a pilot program for about 60 uh, res uh, residents who are participating in this. And we'd like to make that a series and continue to do that. So I, I, th I think it's hard for me to find another way to say, say other than the, the appetite for this work is tremendous. Um, and there's a lot of work for us still to do in Arlington uh, in terms of really focusing um, on equity and intentionally trying to make improvements and make gains in Arlington. So finding the right way for Jill to be able to spend her time to work with departments to program and plan on around issues of equity while also providing trainings to town staff and residents. It's that combination that has led us to also be requesting funds to be able to hire consultants as appropriate. Um, I, I have, you know, normally I would want to more confidently say, you know, what the one, two, three, four year outlook might be. But another piece of the work that Jill is doing is building an equity action plan, which is what we want to use to guide the next several years of our work around issues of equity. And I think once that's done, um, I can more confidently tell you how I see the work rolling out both financially and from a personnel point of view over the next several years. Um, but right now, I mean, I, I, I even myself probably spend 20% of my work week uh, on issues of DEI right now, which might sound high, but it's, it's very real. Um, I, I have right, uh, individual regular check-ins um, with Jill, with the Human Rights Commission, uh, less frequent, but still regular check-ins with the National League of Cities and the work that they're, they're doing human resources discussions in regards to how we can continue to try to diversify our workforce. So this is, this is really an issue of priority <clears throat> for the town from my point of view. And I know the select board in its endorsement of the creation of an equity action plan, as well as the endorsement of the racial justice teachings that are currently underway uh, reflects um, the commitment to the, this work on the, on the part of the leadership of the town. Alan, Alan Jones. I, I, I guess you sort of touched the, on this already, but I was just looking for a, uh, you know, good definition of the, the purpose and the goal of a division and how that can be measured as you know, so the number of phone calls you get, is it, you know, less than 20% of your time and, and, and will it be measured? You know, is there a uh, opportunity to measure just to make sure that it's, um, you know, money well spent to achieve a stated set of goals? So I, I think there's some aspects of this that are harder to measure than others, but there's definitely some aspects that can be measured. I think the easiest to measure is making strides or improvements in the diversity of our workforce. Um, we are still a majority white community, but Arlington's not necessarily as white as it once was. It's probably roughly 80% white. Um, whereas our municipal workforce, I don't have it handy, but I think our municipal workforce is nearly 92 or 93% white. So at the very least, um, I think we'd like to work towards having a workforce that's reflective of um, the makeup of the community. So I think that is something we could uh, very easily measure. We, we currently measure uh, workforce diversity statistics and we can measure that against current stats over time. I think another big chunk of the work uh, that we want to do is really uh, identify and dismantle the presence of institutional racism across Arlington departments. Um, I, I mean, that can be measured in that it can be documented and shared. Uh, I'm not sure if that's, you know, the precise use of the word uh, measured, but 
uh, we, we want to go department by department, policy by policy, and identify where <clears throat> programs, policies, documents, applications um, are perpetuating systemic or institutional racism and eliminate them. And I think that, again, we, you know, it might not be the exact use of the word measurement, but I think that that's work we can document over time. Okay. Um, so, some aspect of this is trying to make Arlington as welcoming a place as possible, or at least Arlington town government as welcoming as possible. And that's hard to measure, right? And it, but, but I think that is, a, that is also part of this overall goal. Yeah, I, I guess and I'll, I'll, I'll be blunt, you know, in, in a couple of years, we're probably going to ask the taxpayers to open their wallets again. And when they look back and say, this happened, was that money well spent? Uh, it'd be good to have a portfolio of, to, to show, yes, this was money well spent. Um, so I just, I'm just, whenever we're, even now, even things that are well established, I want to keep in my mind, how do we go to the taxpayers and say, this is money well spent? What we've invested here, we've gotten a good return on. So that's really where I was going with it. Thank you. Yep, that, I, I, that's, that's can, I, can I also add that she is taking over the managing the Human Rights Commission, the Rainbow Com, um, Commission, and the Disability Commission, and also that she was just recognized. I saw in the paper she was just recognized for her role statewide. So, true. That, some she, measure. She, True. That is true. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, Annie, 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 Annie you have your hand up. Yes, Annie. I just wanted. I just wanted to ask Adam whether or not he would agree that, in general, um, one's budget should reflect one's values. Yes, I, I, that's what I try to tell everybody. So, yes, I believe that is true. Any Any other questions for? The town manager on this budget? Yes, John. John, you're on mute. Um, Adam, uh, the federal government just, Congress just voted a huge amount of money <clears throat> in, in the budget <clears throat> for relief, et cetera. And I'm wondering, and I thought there was a fair amount for cities and towns. And I'm wondering uh, if, if that impression is correct. And if so, uh, can it help uh, with our unfunded uh, liabilities with uh, pensions and things? John, I think that's, uh, maybe we can come back to that a little bit later, if you if you don't mind. It's sort of off the current subject. Okay. I am happy to speak to that when the time is right. Uh, okay, thank you. So um, I, I just uh, par partially would echo what Alan was just saying. Um, you know, my, if I were to take a, a, a very dispassionate view of this, um, you know, it, it seems to me like you're asking for an open checkbook over the next several years without a plan and without a method of measuring success. Um, I mean, I, I, the, the idea that we should have a, a workforce in town that's representative of the population is, is a good idea. But, you know, from my understanding, we've had trouble hiring people regardless of their ethnicity, okay? That just, you know, having uh, firemen and police, uh, what's the word, uh, poached by other communities. And I can think of a recreation director that has been in and out of Arlington several times moving to other communities. I mean, it, it, there's, a certain, um, there's a certain difficulty in, Maintaining a workforce, and I'm not, and and I'm not sure that um, these goals are maybe even achievable. I don't know, and I'm trying to relate the, the funds you're asking to what the goals are, other than uh, things to be that are that are that are nice, but are they achievable, and at what cost? So I, I, I definitely, uh, and if I, if I sounded like I was asking for an open checkbook, I'm sorry. Um, that wasn't even remotely my intention. Um, I, I think what I was trying to say is I, I can't confidently tell you that I will be recommending a decrease in that budget in years to come, but I think we're going to, from the equity action plan that we're developing, 
learn more about how we see that work playing out from a staff versus consultant point of view in future years. Um, I mean, but we, I mean, potentially we might agree to disagree about the value of measuring the diversity of the workforce. Um, I mean, I do think, again, we can document the identification and then eradication of instances of institutional racism across town departments. Um, so I, I do think there is tremendous value in doing that work. Thank you. Um, are there other questions for um, town management on the subject of the DEI department and the budget? Okay, thank you, uh, Adam and Sandy. So the next uh, subject was uh, IT. And uh, let me turn that over to uh, Al and uh, uh, Ar Arif. Al, do you want me to take this? Sure, go ahead. Okay, so I sent an email to David and I copied Sandy Pooler. And so I'm going to go through my email one by one. And so maybe, and some of the ones, Sandy, if you don't, or Adam don't have the answer and they're more IT related, you can just tell me. And then David can provide that answer because David responded to me today saying he had sent the questions to Sandy Pooler and he was wait, with his answers, his section of the answers, and then wait, was waiting for a response from Sandy. But I, my understanding was that some of these answers you'll get today from you guys. And then the remaining you can email to us, which the sections are for David. So let me just uh, flip over here. Okay, so this was, we had presented, I had presented, our team had presented the budget to the FinCom a couple of nights ago and some of the questions that came up. Number one, ICS. Uh, several of the committee, I'm just gonna read it out. Okay, so for, for everyone to know. Um, several of the, Committee members have been hearing about ICS being retired for the last three to four years. What is the timeline for ICS truly going away, quote unquote? So if you could please give us an understanding of that. Um, ICS is currently used uh, for our water and sewer billing. Um, we have been in the process of trying to convert that fully to Munis. Um, later this year, uh, I think David's email says fourth quarter 2021, uh, he anticipates that changeover. Um, once it is changed over, I think there are two things we would have, we would look at. One, keeping ICS in place, not to do any further billing, but just as a backup in case questions come up into the future about, um, status of accounts or uh, make, making sure that when data were converted from ICS to Munis that um, we didn't miss anything. Uh, sometimes there are uh, you know, back bills that have to be paid or liens and so forth. And so it's important to go back and look at that. Um, after a, about the first year or so, I think the issue is what do we need, need to do to keep that those data in place in case uh, the treasurer collector or uh, the assessor need to go back and look at it, whether that means keeping ICS going or transferring that those data into some other format is yet to be determined. I will say, however, that currently we have uh, between ICS and Informix, I think 30 seats, 30 licenses to be able to use that software. And in the future, because people, won't be using it generally, we can cut that down to probably uh, a couple of licenses. We spend about $7,000 now uh, on those licenses. And so I expect in the future, a, a year from now, we should be able to um, reduce that to a lower amount uh, and then maybe even eliminate it. Although we, again, we've had conversations but have not determined the exact right way to be able to access that old information in case we need it. Okay, so I know you had an ICS, I'm just gonna ask a follow-up question, might be too technical, and so we can go to the IT guy, but um, so there was an ICS consultant helping with this integration and all the rest. 
and um, I'll just ask the question. Um, as part of this migration, you know, why not back it up into a more uh, relevant and uh, current technology? Because informics, I mean, I realize informics, I know of informics since 1986, 1990, and I built my first company in the database world. And it's definitely not around anymore. I mean, it is in, in a very meager sense, but uh, definitely a very old system. So um, I'll just leave it out there. You might not have the answer to this, but um, any migration you know, should involve some aspect of uh, backup recovery scenario to begin with. But, uh, you know that by any chance as to why would because it's even going a year out after that I can understand that back billing and all that is necessary but cannot it be done in a more relevant and um, future a more relevant and current technology well we have the capacity and we will uh, back up some of it into Munis um, but those records go back a long way uh, and so our capacity and ability to put all of that into Munis is limited. We have had discussions, as I mentioned, about what other technology to use uh, so that we don't have to rely on ICS and Informix anymore. Um, that is a discussion being taken up within IT, and they have not yet made a recommendation as to what other technology we might use, but it has been discussed. Okay. All right, well, I'll, I'll leave it there. The second question was about Informix, which you touched upon. And uh, so unless somebody else in the committee has another question about Informix, the Informix question was as follows. I think it's been uh, mostly answered. Let me just read it out for completeness. Informix also, and importantly, the back end to ICS Informix. When will that be retired? You had mentioned that there is a need for the utility bill billing to become stable before this happens. However, there was no concrete timeline stated. The FinCom would like to have a retirement sunset date for ICS and informants in writing. I suppose you have told us the timeline just to be repetitive, that by Q4 2021, the last existing water and sewer billing system will move to Munis, after which um, uh, you'll keep the ICS for backup for a while, perhaps a year, ICS, and Informix licenses will go down from 30 to two. Is that all correct? Um, that is my best guess when I say two, but yes, something like that. I'll leave it to IT to make that final call. Okay, you had said couple and couple I, I translated to two. So, <laughs> I um, think that's it's a reasonable guesstimate. Okay, fine. Thank you. Uh, let me go to my next question. Um, line, uh, so, Line 5305, this is a long, a bit long, so bear with me. But software maintenance for which the budget, 2022 budget says 109,210, an increase of 61,210, which is 127.52% increase. I'd ask the question, break this down, uh, please break this down and explain the spend in, each, in this line item. Also, and importantly, we feel that this line item is misclassified and in parentheses, as are many others in this budget close parentheses, as this is not truly software maintenance as it includes software purchase, recurring costs and the like. When will that nomenclature be addressed? Continuing on, from a prior email, I had explained to the committee that perhaps the 109,000 comes from 20K for five departments plus incidentals of seven to eight K. Not sure if that's it. Also, there was a mention that 25,000 was for Office 365. And how was that represented? So in short, please provide a comprehensive breakdown of this line item number 5305. So if you could, please. Um, so the current spending in there, uh, there's tw about 26,000 for uh, a data cloud hosted server imaging and back backup software, 2,405 for desktop authority remote delivery software, 3,430 for APC Symmetra UPS license renewal, $3,200 for Untangle Fireware slash intrusion detection license renewal, $4,700 uh, 
for WebRoot antivirus license renewal, $5,088 for Barracuda archiver license renewal, $1,800 for Jitbit help desk software license renewal, and $725 for M. Damon email license renewal, totaling $47,716.56. Um, so that is um, the basis for the current spending. And then there is um, a request to increase uh, this for some of the new things that IT is looking for. Um, the layout of these into this line item or another, I think is something we're always looking at and I'm certainly open to continuing that discussion. Uh, again, at the at the end of it, the importance in the department isn't, um, isn't these line items, it's the bottom line. Um, we do make an effort in talking to the departments to make sure things are lined up correctly. Um, and David in his response said, I believe we can do research to make distinctions between licensing and maintenance uh, for FY2223. Let's see. So um, the total layout for monies for uh, for the licensing software that we're talking about is one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. That includes six thousand uh, dollars for writing of two apps for health and human services and inspectional services modules. Um, in addition, there's a capital budget request for $132,860 uh, for purchasing the uh, software, this licensing software, and $42,000 uh, that's in the uh, 22 operating budget. Uh, we have applied for grants, but we're not uh, awarded those grants for this system. Uh, and then uh, over and above that, the increases that they're looking for is $20,000 for an increase uh, for the Office 365 licenses. Okay, so I, so I have a, okay, so I got I got I got all that forty seven seven sixty, which is the forty eight thousand that you had mentioned, which is the current spend. So the delta of sixty one thousand two hundred and ten, which is the new increase. Um, I didn't hear that exact breakdown. Could you? Help me with that one. So I think twenty. The last twenty thousand of that uh, is for the Office three sixty five licenses. Okay. And uh, I think the rest of it is um, for the licensing software. Licensing for what? All the what? Do you for know software we... for departments that issue permits. We don't have a permit permit module. We looked at it in Munis, but it was too expensive. So we've looked at other modules to do that. 40,000 is for licensed software for permitting, uh, permitting, right? And Office 365 was, well, I was originally told 25K, but okay, 20K, fine. Uh, that's what, that's what uh, David's email says. No problem. So that adds up to 60K, okay. So that's the, that's the net increase, right? Okay. Okay. If you could do me a favor and send me all that stuff, or is David sending me that stuff in writing? Because I'd love to have it circulated. Oh, certainly. I, I thought he had sent it to you, but I'd be glad oh, to make sure you get it. it. Yeah. No. No, I, if I had it, that would be great. But, anyways, okay. So then I go to the next line or the next question, line 5353. I'll read it again. Munis software support. First, you had mentioned that this budget was 10K overstated. So we plan to remove the 10K from this budget. That's fine. That's fine. Okay, great. So that 10K is now removed. Second, you had mentioned that there was a hosting agreement. When I say you, this was addressed to David, just to be clear. And mentioned that there was a hosting agreement that was being signed imminently and that that would provide a payback uh, slash credit of up to 52,000. That's calculated 13,600 times four months for the maintenance that was prepaid on the on-prem Munis software that would no longer be charged once moved online. So the question asked by our FinCom was, should we not re reduce the budget 
for the line 53, 53 by 52K. That's additional, not, not that other 10,000 that we just mentioned. And if not, why not? And uh, additional comment I received on this was, if you're getting a refund, the gross amount should not be budgeted, but the net amount. So any comments around this 52K and how we should address that in line 5353? Yes, so the contract to be able to move Munis from being hosted on town computers to being hosted in the cloud uh, should go through the end of its legal review this week. So we expect to be able to move forward and get it signed with Munis. If we get, uh, get it up and running, for the end of this fiscal year, we may have two or three months at about $13,000 a month of savings. If that is the case, that savings would happen in fiscal year 21. So in other words, uh, the money wouldn't be spent this year or be refunded this year. Um, and so I think what it would end up being is coming back to uh, the general fund. Uh, as free cash. Um, I do not think that that would have an impact or should have any impact on what the budget should look like uh, for FY22, which is the budget that's currently under review. Um, David has asked that, and I'm gonna read this, I would request that we keep this money to pay any consulting costs as a result uh, of paying either Charles Norton or Eric Weil for uh, software support. Um, Charles also supports, in addition to the ICS work that he's done, uh, supports the assessors, Patriot uh, Property System, Inspectional Services System, Police Department, Ticket Track System, and a number of other processes. I do want to make just reiterate, I, I think you're, many of you are probably aware that Charles Norton has worked for the town for many years. He's retiring. Uh, so we have taken him out of the water and sewer budget, which is where he was fully budgeted in the past uh, and uh, taking his $100,000 salary out of there. I think we've left something like 25 in there in case um, we do need him to come back to do anything with ICS as I was talking about before. But uh, we had moved him out of the general fund because he really wasn't doing a tremendous amount of general fund work, although occasionally he may do some consulting. So it is the IT directors feeling that the savings will happen this year and not next year, and that therefore next year's budget request not be cut. Okay, thank you for that answer. I'll give you, I'll move to the next question. Um, I'll just pause here. Any questions so far from the rest of the group? Uh, I see Annie has a hand, hand up, so I want to ask Annie, a question. Annie and Alan had their hands up, but I think why don't you just get through your thing. questions okay. and let's okay. go back, okay? Oh, okay. there are just three more questions. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, in the salary section, the position for the new IT director was being advertised at 124K and not 153.7K, as was noted during our meeting when we met with David. And, uh, as, as, and as, as we had wondered why it was at the top of the great salary table. So the question is, is that really what the salary details should reflect? What is the true update for that line? And more importantly, one of the questions asked by the FinCom members was, do you believe that you will be able to attract individuals at this salary? What is the realistic number please provide? That is a very good question. I do not know the answer to that question. I think it's a difficult question. Uh, I do think that uh, it would be our preference not to hire at the top of the scale. I also think in this, uh, environment, particularly for IT jobs, uh, we will have to pay a competitive salary. I do not know what that salary is. Uh, we are just starting the uh, recruitment process, uh, and I do not expect it to be completed until um, until June. Um, so by uh, level funding it, we thought that was um, the most uh, cautious or, or prudent, excuse me, prudent is the word I want to use, prudent way to budget. The decision about the salary we pay is not, will not ultimately be based on the number that's currently in the budget. It will be based on 
what we think that we can, uh, a reasonable amount we can pay to get a highly qualified person to fill the position. Uh, and uh, if we hire somebody for less, uh, then we, of course, will return any excess money to the general fund at the end of the year. Okay, so you're going to, just to be clear, you're going to leave it at that number, the high end of the range, and then see where it ends up and then adjust it accordingly. Okay, that's better. correct. Okay, let me move on to the next question. Uh, hang on. I lost my page. Oh, here we go. Um, okay, given all the spend on the application, the hosting, and software automation in general that is continuing to happen in our town systems, my comment, great stuff, by the way, that should reduce the number of personnel required. And thus, we would not see a reduction in sal, and thus, would we not see a reduction in salaries and headcount? Um, and and that comment saying that yeah. these savings may be in other budgets, I don't know. So please perhaps clarify. So I think the most obvious example of that is uh, Charles Norton's position, which uh, we are cutting out of the water sewer budget and um, we will, there are other changes to water sewer that will come about because of the health insurance numbers that we just got in on Friday. So we will have a revised budget for you uh, for that uh, and for some of the other enterprise funds. Um, but that certainly has been uh, the most direct personnel cut that has resulted from these munis upgrades. Uh, I, uh, I don't, I don't have a list of other possible cuts because uh, I'm unaware of other cuts that are uh, looming. Um, I do think the areas <clears throat> where we've worked, we've increased efficiency, we've increased customer service, uh, and um, that is part of the reason that we've had to continue to invest uh, in Munis and other things. Uh, we used to have systems that really didn't talk to each other and it made our um, comptroller's lives and treasure collector's lives painful. Uh, I think things are moving much better now and so we're able to get things done much more quickly. Um, I will say, I, I may have mentioned this to the finance committee the last time I talked, but um, one of the things that we bought recently was DocuSign, which enables people like Adam and department heads to electronically sign contracts, which means that we've taken somewhere between two and four weeks out of the process to get contracts approved because we no longer have paper moving back and forth. It also, that means uh, recently that we put out bids and contracts for things like uh, uh, field repairs and playground repairs. And we've gotten very good uh, bids back. I think we're saving a considerable amount of money because we're getting those bids back a month earlier than we ever were able to put them out before. And there's more competition. So I do think that um, these investments in technology has made us more efficient it doesn't necessarily always mean that we're going to lose staff, um, but I do think that there are very real uh, cost savings that um, have accrued because of them. Okay, so net net, just in summary, you're saying these savings, yeah, we understand about efficiency, that's great. And thank you for, for that. But um, in terms of um, effective savings dollar, dollar wise, they will show up in other budgets. Uh, is that what my takeaway is from this? Yes, I, yes, because it, it's in other departments where you'll, if, if there, and there was in that case of the water and sewer department. So uh, is there a way to, I mean, this might be hard to do, but is there a way that you can quantify that or at least highlight that so that the next time around I'm grilled on this question, there is an answer that I can easily point to? Sure, I would be glad to, um, when we come back with the, uh, water sewer budget, which should be in a matter of a couple of days because we're, again, just getting the uh, health insurance stuff together. Uh, I will give you a number that uh, you can refer to uh, for those savings. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think we've come to the last question. So there was a presentation by Elizabeth 
Dre during a meeting on Monday, uh, March 8th, where she, via warrant article number 21, wanted monies to be appropriated for remote meeting participation. The question from our FinCom is, does this money need to be appropriated or can this be, or can this effort be absorbed by the IT department? So I think there are two areas in which she suggested uh, possibly spending money. One was for uh, Zoom licenses so that meetings could be broadcast just as they are now. Um, that is money that we've uh, been able to use CARES Act money for. And I think uh, certainly part of next year we'll continue to use CARES Act money for. Um, I don't know exactly what the structure of meetings being broadcast on Zoom is going to be. Um, I think that is one, an issue of uh, how the open meeting law changes or doesn't change going forward. The governor has allowed by his uh, proclamation has allowed uh, public meetings to continue on Zoom. It is not clear yet whether that will continue to be the case. Uh, and that will have relevance for um, how committees meet and how citizens do or do not get to participate and speak at those meetings. So we are still waiting for, uh, for more information and clarity from the state on that. Um, I think we also uh, secondly need to talk um, to committees about how they want to operate. Uh, you have some committees like finance, select board, school committee and the redevelopment board that are currently broadcast on ACMI. I think these committees have to make a decision whether you want to continue to use Zoom or not. Uh, we have had, we're just, we need to have those conversations in the future uh, with the committees. Uh, and uh, in addition to there are several other committees that are not broadcast. And uh, I think we need to make decisions about whether those would be continued to be broadcast on Zoom. As a, from a policy point of view, I think we are in favor of the idea of uh, openness. Uh, and I do believe we will continue to have Zoom licenses, um, but we do not have a comprehensive plan going forward at this point as to how those will uh, roll out. Uh, finally, the other area for um, spending might be, it has been suggested by Ms. Dre that we buy uh, either Chromebooks or iPads or something like that to give to committee members and or members of the public to ensure that they have access to Zoom meetings. I was not in talking to her able to identify any identified need for anybody who would need that equipment. <clears throat> I also have my skepticism about whether that is a proper use of public funding to be giving people public iPads. Um, so I would, uh, I would not support that expenditure, um, both because I don't think it's needed and I, it is my personal opinion that I don't think it is um, something we should be spending money on. All in all, I have some skepticism about why town meeting needs to vote on this in the first place. And I certainly would not suggest spending money. We have been doing a lot of work at the administrative level on, uh, on making meetings public and we will continue to look at that going forward. Uh, and so it does not seem to me that this is an article that, um, that is really necessary, frankly. Perfect, thank you for a comprehensive answer. Now, um, I guess there are some hands raised, but Charlie- yeah, Thank, thank you, Arif, appreciate it. Yep. Okay, so um, Annie LaCourt, you had your hand up. You must be tired of being up all this time. <laughs> It's, it's being taken care of for me by my minions. Um, so I had a couple of questions back on the IT expense budget. The first one is that you we determined that about $40,000 of line 5305 is going to put in the new um, permitting system. And it's showing up in an expense line. So I'm wondering whether or not it's $40,000 worth of licensing that is going to continue year over year. Or is this a one-time investment? I think it is on, there are some ongoing licenses as I understand it. 
I can confirm that though. Okay. If I could jump in for a second, there's a hundred and thirty-two thousand dollar capital item for new permitting software. So I think a hundred and thirty. 2000 that was mentioned as a capital expense in the capital budget. Right, I, I get that. Where I'm going is that often these systems are paid for by a small surcharge on the permits. And it sounds like that's not what we're doing here. We're actually licensing the software. We would, uh, if we had a license that would have to run as, uh, as revenue through the general fund and be reappropriated and not just incorporate, we could, it needs to be an appropriation if we're taking in license fees. Right. So we would still have to appropriate the expense. And then if we have increased revenue because of that, we could offset it that way, but we can't just absorb it behind okay. the scenes. So could we get an answer to the question of whether or not there's going to be some kind of offset? Like, I'd really like to know what their pricing structure is because it's unusual these days that you would pay $40,000 a year in license fees for. Uh, Annie, I think the select board has to uh, set fees, right? It's uh, not that. It's, it's that, that the pricing is usually, yeah, I think it's a conversation we take offline. Okay. I'll, so I'll, I will follow up with you on that. Okay. Um, but my other question then is about the Munis software maintenance. So we're moving to a hosted solution, but it's not reducing our annual cost on Eunice maintenance, is that what you're saying? It's displacing some of the costs like having to buy and run those servers right? with having to pay them to, um, to keep the data offsite. It's a this decision about moving that way that IT has gone back and forth for, on, mm -hmm. for many years. But I think they think even though economically it doesn't change the situation, uh, that significantly, in other words, there's no big savings. In fact, it's probably a little more expensive. Mm. There is greater reliability. Uh, we won't have to worry about it as we move IT out of the high school over to DPW and having something go wrong with Munis all at once because it'll be Munis's problem at that yeah. point. No, no, I, I, I'm not at all questioning the move to the cloud. I would, yes. every one of our systems would move to the cloud. Um, and it sounds like mostly we're doing that, but my concern was that we're not getting any cost savings on it. It's a pretty high licensing amount per year, um, even though it does everything, including sits to nuts. Um, but it was just a question, not a desire to uh, make any changes that would bring that cost. Um, great, if you can follow up with me on the permitting, um, that would be great. And we'll do that offline. Alan Jones? Uh, two really simple questions. It looks like all of the Office 365 licensing is going is going to be covered by the IT budget. Uh, can I therefore take those out of the FinCom expense line, the 22 licenses? Um, I, think, I think so. Uh, let's just double check with that. I assume that um, you can use those licenses. I don't know if you've had conversations with IT about that, but um, they, they, because they, I have said, not. They, they, as usual, they say to ask you. <laughs> 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 it's really just, you know, where does the money get spent? But, uh, you know, just if we can yeah, take so, it out of the FinCom line, that'd be great. Yeah, I will. Uh, I'll confirm that and I'll follow up with you. Alan. Okay. Second question, and I'm not sure this is the right time for it, is the question of the providing email, the cost of providing email addresses for town meeting members. Um, so, yes, I, I there, it would article. be somewhere north of $20,000, I think $22,000, they're about, they're about $90 a piece. And there are 252 town meeting members. So, so that's, that's equivalent to the whole licensing cost for the whole town staff, is what you're it saying. Is, it is the same as the town staff fee. Uh, we get a reduced rate for some of our public safety personnel, but uh, for the rest of us, it is uh, that fee. Yeah, I mean, 90 is not a reduced rate. That's 50% more than I pay, but... Um, but still, that's sixty dollars a year times two fifty two is a lot of money. But yes, okay, it is a Thank lot you. of money, and it, it it is also not yet clear to me whether under that license, which is supposed to be only for town employees, whether town meeting members would qualify. Yeah, um, I'm still working to get an answer on that. 
We could probably save money if they don't qualify and just buy retail. Um, that, may be, that may be true. But it's still a lot of money. Thank you. It is a lot of money. Thank you. Any other questions, uh, Shane? Thanks, Charlie. Uh, jumping off Alan's question, Sandy, are town meeting members subject to the public records law? Is that, is that, well, is town that... meeting is subject to the public records law. But, um, and if you were to use a town off supplied email, then anything in those emails would be subject to public records requests. Thank you. <laughs> Alan Shane. Okay, so I see uh, no other questions. So um, I, I would just like to um, uh, make an editorial comment, if I may. I think the various questions on the on the the uh, IT budget have been, you know, exhaustively asked and exhaustively answered. Um, but <clears throat> the um, I think Annie, in, in sort of two two instances, touched on. Uh, something that's has vexed me for a long time, and that is, uh, I don't think we have a comprehensive way of tracking reductions in ex operating expenses that flow from making a capital investment, and and it, that's what I think Andy was touching on with respect to some of the software uh, acquisition, and and I think that. Um, Sandy, a related question or related topic, you were mentioning these uh, cost reductions and efficiencies that, that um, result from uh, software or, or, or you know, uh, permit, permitting software and other types of software that, that enhance the operation and they reduce the cost. Now, I, I know, for example, and I'm, I'm not, specifically citing the treasurer's department for, for any particular reason other than I have a, a, a multi-decade rela relationship to it. Um, and that is that we long had very expensive cash handling in the treasurer's department with multiple cashiers and people standing in line paying money, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, a number of years ago, uh, uh, one of our finance committee members did an exhaustive comparison of Arlington to five or six other communities and the size of their treasury departments versus the size of the population, et cetera. And we consistently came out higher, more people in the office, more hands-on doing things and fundamentally less efficiency. Now, I know uh, recently in the last several years, we put in some new cash uh, management units in, in, in tracking systems in the, in the treasurer's department. And I don't think we've seen any reduction in staffing. And you mentioned that we have these other software programs that we're investing in and that they uh, produce cost reductions and efficiencies, which show up in higher levels of service. And, you know, it might be a higher level of service to the taxpayer to have a lower cost. In other words, we shouldn't automatically assume that if we can do something more efficiently and at a lower cost, we have to then go ahead and do something else to keep justifying the cost level that we're at. So uh, my, my request is that somehow we incorporate, um, I don't know if it's a cost benefit analysis or some sort of a, of a view where we understand these investments that we're making what the cost reductions are, and how do we translate that into a benefit for the taxpayer, uh, other than institutionalizing uh, positions in, inside uh, town government? That was well, an editorial I, comment. I don't know if you have an answer to that. <laughs> but uh, I would just say, uh, I think we are always looking at the efficiency of departments. I think that, one, number two, uh, there are growing demands from the public for uh, more electronic access, uh, more uh, the ability to pay bills in, in different ways. And I don't think the town has much choice but to keep up with those demands. It's the 21st century and people just expect us to do business that way. We're not, uh, we're three, a lot of these investments are replacing things that were just 
not not working right, not efficient, <laughs> and could not keep working the way they were. We had to make investments to get a a, a functional system. Um, and um, I won't talk about any particular department. Um, I mean, I know there have been discussions about various departments. We have had discussions with several department heads about what their needs are. Um, and uh, okay. if there are opportunities to make cuts, I think that we have. Uh, and we will continue to make cuts. We will also try to be responsive to the ever pressing demands of the public here who expects the town to run, run well, and that is what we try to do. Thank you. And don't, don't misinterpret. I'm not looking for quote unquote wholesale cuts here, but you know, people retire, uh, businesses can, and departments can reorganize and people can shift around and we can wind up providing high level of services with automation with lower personnel costs. We, so that every position doesn't have to be filled when it, you know, when someone retires or leaves. I mean, it, it, there are ways to achieve personnel and uh, cost efficiencies uh, through, uh, you know, somewhat benign efforts as opposed to quote unquote cuts, if you can understand what I'm saying. I do, thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. The, um, <clears throat> the next- um, Charlie, Charlie, yes. I have a question. Yes, John. Charlie, uh, uh, Sandy, I thought that uh, the federal government was providing large amounts of money to cities and towns in the new budget. Is that correct? And what might we expect there? Do you have some idea? Well, uh, there has been a report uh, put out uh, by Congress about how much money is out there for a wide variety of purposes, um, including making up for lost revenue. Um, they have set a standard to say uh, the difference in what we are getting in, well, they're using FY19 as a base year. So we have started tracking the difference between what we've been taking in in the current year in FY19 to see what uh, losses of revenue we can um, demonstrate uh, now and going forward. There's also uh, a whole lot of uh, potential spending on continuing COVID uh, programs. So things that we might have to spend money on that would not come out of the general fund, we can insulate the general fund from those expenses. So we'll continue to do that. Uh, there's also uh, a large possibility of spending money to provide relief directly to businesses, to renters, and, and others. Um, and so I do think a substantial part of the money that's being talked about may end up going in that direction. We are waiting for regulations to come out from the Treasury Department uh, to define the specific terms for all of those areas, um, to set the parameters for how we measure uh, things like lost income and how we define who would be eligible for relief. Um, and we don't know, yet know what those things are. Um, so John, I'm, I'm sorry, it's a long circular way of saying, I don't know the answer yet, uh, but we're looking at it very closely and we will grab as much of it as we can to replace lost revenue and have it go into the general fund. And then the rest of it we will use to uh, help the public as outlined in the law. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I would just also add, um, I, I have a, a spreadsheet and an email with a brief description that outlines much of what Sandy just described that I can forward to the chair and to Liz Diggins tomorrow for share uh, to share with the committee. Um, one additional point I know John had raised earlier, whether or not these funds could be used to benefit long-term liabilities such as, such as pension costs. And unfortunately, the, the statute or the bill actually explicitly prohibits use of these funds for municipal pension systems. So we'll, we'll wait to see a little more about whether or not OPEB is included in that, but I know for, for certain we won't be able to use it to offset uh, a pension liability. Thank you, Adam. You're welcome. Thank you, Sandy. All right, Charlie, I have a question. Yes. Mary Margaret. Um, given the way we're structuring the diversity committee, 
Could, um, with the, the commissions that she's taking over, we would no longer have to fund, correct? So we could at least take that money back. You know, we give them like $1,000 per committee, I believe. Oh, I think the committees would still very much be asking for those funds for their small expenses. Okay. Okay, so um, I, I think that you have addressed the major issues that we had before us. Um, the sort of the uh, last item, and Sandy, is this question of expense budgets. You and I chatted on the phone about that today. And related to it, uh, I had uh, the subject of the DPW budgets, which sort of is related to that subject. We had a, a, a long conversation about it at the last meeting. And, um, you know, it's, it's actually related to just the general uh, issue of how expense budgets are presented. Do you have any comments you'd like to make on either the presentation of the expense budgets in DPW? And I'm referring to the differences between the budgeted, I'm sorry, let me get this straight again. The differences between the reported actual expenses in 20 and the budgets in 21 and 22. Sure, I, I'll start and then Adam, if that's all right, if you wanna add anything. No, you, you can certainly start, go ahead. So within the, the budget book, we, we report on um, what is spent within a current year's budget. So in the budget book, you see, for example, FY20 actuals. And what you're seeing there is a report of how much um, was spent in FY20 from what was appropriated uh, in FY20. However, uh, in departments and particularly DPW, it is often the case that they will encumber money from a previous year let's say the FY19 budget, and spend that money in FY20 uh, instead. So um, just to give you an example, in natural resources, uh, I think in the, the budget, it says that the expenses in FY20 were $331,000. But if you look at what was carried over uh, from the previous year, uh, it was actually $403,000 on a, uh, so from year to year, there's more money being spent than shows up in the budget book. Um, there are, we've tried to publish the manager's budget by just keeping within current year spending because we think that's how it has historically been um, printed and is therefore useful that way. Um, if you also take money, if you print a budget that shows taking money out from one year and moving it into the next year, and at the same time, then taking money from, let's say, FY20 and moving it into FY21, the numbers all start to get look a little funky. Um, that is a gap way of doing it. We could do it that way, but we thought it would be clearer in terms of budgets uh, to do it the way we did. Um, also in DPW, they do tend to move money among different divisions and different line items. So that if in an, any one year, there are a lot of trees that need to be planted, for example, in natural resources, they tend to move money from other areas and then spend it in natural resources. So that the real spending uh, that goes on uh, by that carryover money is lot larger than the budgets in those areas. Um, so that is one point I would like to make. The second point I'd like to make is, uh, I did see Charlie's memo today that was sent to all of you showing expense budget changes. I counted uh, of different departments and including all the individual divisions within uh, DPW, um, there were 19 of them that had no uh, expense budget change. They may have moved money among lines, but there was no bottom line change. There were 13 in which there were changes. However, uh, four of those were actually reductions. One of them was a change of $200. Um, and as I think Charlie's memo 
uh, mentioned, one of them was um, the increase in finance, which we may be able to get rid of. So as a general matter, it's been my impression that, uh, it's been my experience certainly that we have level funded expense budgets for many years running. And we occasionally add things to those budgets. Uh, and we do allow departments to move things among their budget lines. Um, but if there is a concern that we're increasing operating budgets, and particularly expense budgets, um, by large amounts, um, I think in general that has not happened. There are a couple of things that we talked about, such as um, IT and DEI, um, where there were increases, and I think we explained the reasons for that. Uh, but in general, uh, we have had expense budgets that have not changed, have not gone up with inflation uh, for many, many years. Um, so I would ask, I think going forward, if people do have concerns about the expense budgets, to share that information because um, I'd certainly like to know what your concerns are. Uh, but it's my impression that they have not really gone up significantly in any way. Uh, so very briefly, those are my comments at the, at the moment. Alan? Um, just for my clarification, I, I was comparing the um, actuals in the budget book to the actuals in the CAFR and in, in the audit reports. And the actuals in the budget book looked very close to the actual spent, but not the carry forward. Going forward, in other words, it, it, it doesn't look like the 27 carry forward is showing up in 2018 and the 2018 carry forward is not showing. It, it's almost like the numbers that are carry forward in the audit report just don't show up in the manager's book at all. So there's, there's, there's sort of money, there's sort of actual money that's just disappeared. It's just not there. And you know, I guess that's that's at least part of the issue we're dealing with. And, and it can be pretty substantial in some of the departments, the encumbrances. That's, a, that's exactly right. And we have discussed whether we should include encumbrances and in reports to you or, or go to a kind of gap uh, finance report that is included in the, in, in the CAFR. Although I ha do have to say, I can't, we're not supposed to use the term CAFR anymore. So I will say the oh, really? annual audit. Um, <laughs> So I, I think, you know, I mean, we, we, we don't show actuals in the finance committee report to town meeting. If we did, I think we'd get a lot of questions and the questions in the finance committee, if, if, if it would be possible to include the encumbrances, I think some of these questions we have this year just might go away um, or at least be, be reduced. So it's a suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Carly, can I ask you Andy, uh, Andy has a question. Thank you. I'm sorry, Alan, Costa, you have a question. Yeah, so, so in effect, the budget book is on a cash basis, um, but the, t the controller, w when they finally do the books, has to do it on a, um, uh, you know, on a cruel cool. basis. Um, now, when somebody- Al, Al, Al if, I, if I could just interject, it's, it's not on a cash basis because if it was, then what was encumbered in 2019 would show up in 2020. It's like the, the, what's encumbered in 2019 just disappears. Okay, so wait, really wait, 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 wait. Let, let's just let Al Tosti finish his comment, please. Okay. Uh, but when somebody encumbers money from fiscal 20, for example, isn't it supposed to be for a fiscal 20 purpose? I mean, this is not the school. Uh, you know, can they just roll over money, twenty money for a fiscal twenty-one purpose? Um, no, um, they so they encumber money. Let's say they encumber a hundred thousand dollars. They may or may not actually spend that hundred thousand dollars. So encumbrances in of them that of themselves are not good ways to track what spending is. I just want to make that point. They might spend 20,000 of that hundred. They are supposed to be for um, things that uh, were contracted for, uh, but not paid for in say 20 going into 21. Um, it gets a little squishy when you look at DPW when they're say doing projects over the summer. Um, that's why DPW is probably the hardest to really nail down. 
but other encumbrances are for previous year's expenses that just need to be paid for in the next fiscal year. When, at what point does the controller cut off an encumbrance and, and say, uh, let's say after September 1, if it's not spent, it goes back to free cash? Um, generally, we look at, she looks at them a after the end of the summer. Um, although again, sometimes the billing can take a while. She closes it out by the end of the next fiscal year. So it gets closed out the free cash on, on June 30th. Um, and that's when she really does her closeout. She doesn't really close things out during the year, but um, she monitors that expenses are for what they've been encumbered for. So oh, she has to, out. I'm sorry. In effect, she has to track two numbers in the next year, the fiscal 21 budget and the fiscal 20 encumbrances. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on this subject? Uh, is it okay if I ask a question now? Uh, who was that? It's Brian. Oh, Brian, go right ahead. I'm sorry, I got a, another window hiding your photograph it's, here. It's okay. Um, I think this is um, straightforward and to Sandy, and that is, are the encumbrances ever accounted for in the actual line items? In, in Like for instance, uh, the 2019 actual, uh, does it include the encumbrances of, from 2019? Do they do they show up in 2020, or do they just never appear anywhere? In the for, in well, the manager's well, budget, they never appear anywhere. In the audit, they do appear. No, I understand. I understand in the audit they do. I'm just I'm just referring to the book that we're looking at, which is what's confusing everybody. I believe that that is correct. They do not okay. appear. Okay. Okay. Any other questions on this subject? All right. So uh, just my uh, closing comment, Sandy, is that um, I think uh, 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 Al Jones made the recommendation today that we need to have a separate sit down uh, with you and the comptroller and figure out a way to uh, accurately represent what is actual and what is budgeted so that we can uh, you know, be making clear recommendations and understanding uh, where we're coming from. My view is, if if I just look at the data, okay, your budget in fiscal 21 was two million and thirty-two thousand or something like that, high higher than the actuals in fiscal 20, in the, in the categories that that I presented in that memorandum, and and the work that um, that Al Jones did with the audit report does not contradict that because the, those those his numbers were including salaries and and other things. So I think, it, you know, to, to be making realistic recommendations or have a realistic understanding of these budgets, we have to have a, a clear and rational way of describing what has been spent. And right now, I don't think we have that, at least in my opinion. I'd be very glad to sit down with, with anybody and discuss that. Good. We're always glad to hear that. Uh, so we, we've had the uh, pleasure of having uh, Town Manager Chapter Lane and Deputy Town Manager Pooler here for the last extended period of time, and we thank them very much. Are there any other questions for them before they can get off to a relaxing re what remains of the evening? Okay, there are none. Thank you very much. Appreciate thank your you time. all, everybody. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Good night. Good night. Okay. So, um, let's uh, be, before we go into the um, into the into the um, DPW budgets, let's try to vote on some of these things that we have heard uh, discussed tonight. All right. So um, the town manager has recommended um, supporting article. Uh, well, I'll I'll call it Article sixty five. It may have been renumbered. For thirty-nine thousand one hundred fifty-three dollars and seventy cents for the transportation um, fund, can I? Is there someone who'd like to make a motion? Oh, Don't move. Is there a second? Second. So um, then uh, I'm going to take a vote on. Um, this is the. I'm going to just call it for the purposes of the transportation article. 
Grant Gibbon. Shane Blundell. Aye. Yes. Aye. Grant, did I hear from you? Yes, aye. John Ellis. Mary Margaret Franklin. Yes. Arif Padaria. Yes. Jonathan Wallach, he's not here, he just left. Uh, Brian Beck. Yes. Yes. Peter Howard. Yes. Shailene Pokris. She's not here. Daryl Harmer. Yes. John Dice. Yes. Alan Jones. Yes. Annie LaCourt. Yes. Bill Keller. He's not here. Uh, Al Tosti. Yes. George Koser. Yes. Christine Dechler. Yes. Dean Carmen. Yes. David McKenna. Yes. Thank you. So uh, that article is passed unanimously. Uh, then uh, the next item we discussed was the Health and Human Services budget. <clears throat> so um, let me just get back to that budget here. Page 138, if that's what you're looking for. Uh, I got it. 130. Yeah, I was looking for the table of contents here. Um, okay, health and human services. So we had an extensive um, discussion with the manager with uh, several nights with uh, Mary Margaret on this budget. Uh, do we have a recommendation? Yes, I recommend it be approved. Second. Uh, so you're recommending that the budget be approved for That's printed, yeah. Uh, 811,017. Yes, that's the number. Uh, that's the number on page um, 138 after uh, offsets. Okay. Uh, so it's been moved okay. and seconded. Are there any, uh, is there any questions or further discussions? Um, then I'm going to move forward with the vote on the health and human services. Thank Grant Gibbon. I'll vote yes. Jane Glendale. Yes. John Ellis. Yes. Mary Margaret Franklin. Yes. Arif Padaria. Yes. Brian Beck. Yes. Peter Howard. Yes. Daryl Harmer. Yes. John Dice. Yes. Alan Jones. Yes. Andy Lacourt. Yes. Bill Keller. Yes. Al Tosti. Oh, Bill yep. Keller's not here, right? Al Tosti. Yes. George Koser. Yes. Christine Deschler. Yes. Dean Carmen. Yes. David McKenna. Yes. Thank you, David. So the Health and Human Services budget was voted unanimously. Services. Somebody's got an echo going here on my. David, I think, I think it's you if you don't mind muting. I could be wrong. Okay. Um, the next uh, budget in health and human services is veterans, which I think we already voted, right? Yes, we did. And the next one after that is council on aging. Did we vote that? Um, I think I got all the answers, but I'm not sure that we did vote it. Peter? I don't think so. Okay. So, um, Mary I Margaret? I think we did on Mar March 8th. I believe. Well, pardon me? I believe we did vote on March 8th. Okay. That's what I thought. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. Also the subject of extensive discussion tonight. Right. Um, is there a recommendation on um, the budget for the diversity, equity, and inclusion department? Yes, I, I recommend that we vote it as printed. Second. The amount is $139,561. Uh, 
Is there any further discussion on diversity and equity and inclusion? Grant Gibbion. I vote yes. Shane Blundell. Yes. John Ellis. Yes. Mary Margaret. Yes for approval, yes. Uh, Arif Padaria. Yes. Brian Beck. Yes. Peter Howard. Yes. Shailene Pokris. Oh, she's not here. Daryl Harmer. Yes. John Deist. Yes. Alan Jones. Yes. Annie LaCourt. Yes. Yes. Oh, uh, Alan Tosti. Yes. George Koser. Yes. Christine Deschler. Yes. Dean Carmen. Yes. David McKenna. Yes. Okay. The, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion is yes, unanimously. Um, let's see, retirement. We did that some time ago. Uh, insurance. Okay. So that those are those are finished. Um, so the question is, um, what time is it? Let's see. What so, are we should we um we had your um enterprise funds um we did we do let's see we so we have recreation the arena and council and aging transportation and Arlington Youth uh, Counseling Center and the rec yeah and the rec but didn't we we did one of those right. Uh... Let's see. Let I, I, I didn't think so. I have it. I have the. Uh, I have a crib sheet here. Hang on a second. Um, uh, no, I guess we didn't do it. I don't have a crib on the enterprise fund. So. Let's go to the to the enterprise fund for the uh, Department of Recreation. Oh, okay. So we're going to do something easy like Council on Aging Transportation. We can start with that if you want. Okay. Well, that is on um, page one. Page one, 180. 180. So Council on Council on Aging. Um, Transportation, go ahead. And so you need to know the balance in the enterprise fund for that? Yes. All right, it's 110,551 and 87 cents. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So the, the, yeah. balance, the balance is almost equal to the Total, uh, well, not quite equal to the total expenses, but a substantial balance. Go ahead. Right. Well, because of the virus, I mean, we still have to have the vans picking up the elderly and the people going to the doctors, but um, you can't have too many in there because they have to social distance in the van. So that there's probably more trips. Um, also, the um, they're using, you know, the taxis like they've had before, and Uber and Lyft, and so um, the transportation has become a little more, a little more expensive because you can't fit as many people at a time in these because they, because of the woes, the um, because of the laws with that. So um, also they the. Fans were driving people to vaccine sites in addition to going to their doctor's appointments. Um, so basically, I have nothing to say other than can we approve it the way it's printed? And a lot of the expense has to do with the travel. We get people there while they're safe distancing within the different means of travel. And also, um, what else were they doing? Well, uh, but and Christine did say that they're going to end up using more taxis in the coming months too. 
Well, I don't have anything else to say other than the reason it's expensive is they can only do a few, few people at a time. So are there any comments or questions on this budget, George Koser? I just have a question since some of these expenses are clearly COVID related, both in terms of more trips with fewer folks and going for vaccines. Is there, is there a plan to reimburse some of these from either the CARES Act or the Rescue Act? And if there is, how are we dealing with showing any offsets against those things? I understand yeah. the Rescue Act is uncertain yet, but the CARES right. Act might. Right, and but I think the, that might. I mean, I listened to that um, presentation about money that could possibly be coming, but again, that's it's not a given. So I think the issue really is that um, Christine's trying to provide the same level of service to people who really need it. And it's just more expensive because you can't fit as many people. You can't have more, you know, many people in the van. You can't have many people in a taxi. So it's just, that's just the way it is. I guess my question is, we do know what the CARES Act pays for. And I thought it would pay for some of this. I'm wondering why there, why it isn't or there isn't an offset. That, that's um, she, she said nothing about any, um, I mean, I think she would use any money if there's money from the more more money coming from the CARES Act, she would use it. But there's nothing in the notes that we took when we were talking to her that was more than there are because you need more room to transport people. There's more just more transportation costs. Thank you. I think Sandy was on top of it too. I think Sandy mentioned that that was one of the things he's monitoring in terms of the federal money. And also she's been very good about um, getting grants when she can. And also I think one of their galas is coming up soon. So maybe more people will donate. Well, they, they, show, um, they show an increase in, uh, in donations, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, but they're showing a reduction in CDBG and they're showing a reduction in the use of retained earnings. On the other hand, you're saying that they have $110,000 in retained earnings in the, in the, uh, in the fund. And, yeah. and they're, um, following the Deschler theory of expense accounting, the, um, <laughs> The expenses, uh, the transfer from the general fund went from zero in fiscal 20 to 50,000 in 21, and there's another 50,000 in 22. So there's, you know, more or less a departmental increase of, um, well, in the bottom line, it's 15,000 going from 20 to 21. That's about 10%, 9%. So um, Mary, Mary Margaret, uh, yeah. you know, I think the appropriate thing is to do is to make a recommendation here. And if the committee wants to get additional information, they can move to uh, uh, table it until we get additional information. Okay, and I'd be happy to do that. So in the interim, I think, I believe we should approve this budget as printed. So that's for $140,300 in uh, expenses and $140,300 in income with a retained uh, balance in the fund of $110,551. Yeah. Is there a second? Second. George, you have your hand up or is that from before? It's from before, I'm sorry. Okay. So it's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion on the um, COA transportation uh, budget? Okay. Um, COA transportation. Grant Gibeon. 
Vote yes. Shane Blundell. Yes. John Ellis. Yes. Mary Margaret. Yes. Arif. Yes. Um, Brian Beck. Yes. Peter. Yes. Daryl Harmer. Yes. John Dice. John Dice. Yes. Alan Jones. Yes. Annie LaCourt. Yes. Al Tosti. Yes. George Koser. Yes. Christine Deschler. Yes. Yeah. Dean Carmen. Yes. David McKenna. Yes. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, unanimously passed. So then um, the next uh, enterprise fund would be the Ed Burns Arena. Yeah. Well, it's almost 10 o'clock. I'm just, a, well, we have. Um, the Youth Counseling Center too, there's Rec Rink and Youth Counseling Center, all of which I think are gonna generate a lot of questions. Well, let's um, let's get started and let's see if we can <laughs> get through one of them, come on. Okay. Be, 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 be brave. Okay. All right, then we'll do the Youth Counseling Center. It's on, starts on page 183. I know, I 180, 184 actually. Uh, all right. So let's see, what should I say about this? Um, they're doing a lot more um, telemedicine for obvious reasons, but she said it's working well and it's actually easier for the clinical staff. Um, the social worker who used to be with the police is, has been shifted over to um, AYCC. Um, but I guess it's she's, it's her partially paid for by the police. Um, let's see, what else do I want to say? What's the fund balance? It is. Um, let me tell you in a minute. It is seventy nine thousand. Six hundred and eleven dollars and seventy three cents. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Um, she is looking into any grant money she can come up with. Um, you know, they usually have a gala that draws a lot of funds, but for obvious reasons can't do that. But she's um, they're asking for donations via mail. Uh, uh, let's see. What else is important? Well, I, I can tell you something that's important. What? So um, the expense budget, the total cost of this operation is going up by uh, $76,296 yes. in, in uh, 2022. And uh, all of it is made up from either increased insurance reimbursements, gifts and donations, youth service client fees, or um, CDBG. Mm -hmm. So I think um, I think it has it, the impact on the taxpayer hasn't changed uh, since you know fiscal year twenty. So I think um, that's that's um, you know that should get a merit badge from the finance committee for that right. performance. So moved. She's done a, a great job of one getting all the money she can as well as. Um, getting reimbursed by people's insurance so that it's, you know. So did I hear a mo motion for the $904,135? So move. Sure. Back. And Here's the merit second. badge, Charlie, and the merit badge. <laughs> and the merit yeah, badge, okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so um, this is, let's see, this is the, um, what is this, uh, AYCC? Alan Jones wants to ask a question. Okay, Alan? Uh, quick question. You said a position had been moved from the police budget. Could you tell me which one it is, just so I can make a footnote? The social worker, Opara, I think her name is. Okay, case manager, homeless outreach. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. So uh, the uh, enterprise fund for AYCC with a balance of $79,611 uh, and Proposed expenses of 904,135 and proposed revenues of 904,135 has been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? 
Grant Gibbian? Vote yes. Jane Blundell? Yes. John Ellis? Yes. Mary Margaret? Yes. Gary Padaria? Yes. Brian Beck? Yes. Peter Howard? Yes. Daryl Harmer? Yes. John Dice? Yes. Alan Jones? Yes. Annie LaCourt? Yes. Bill Keller? He's not here. Yeah. Uh, Al Tosti? Yes. George Koser? Yes. Christine Deschler? Yes. Dean Carmen? Yes. And David McKenna? Yes. The the uh, AYCC Enterprise Fund is passed unanimously. Okay. Including the merit badge. And the, including right. the merit badge. <laughs> okay. You. So it's three minutes to 10. Um, I think uh, a motion to adjourn might be in order. So moved. <laughs> um, second. Been moved and seconded. Do I hear any objections to adjourning? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I will try to sort out much. the warrant numbers on the new warrant that we got today uh, for next week. Uh, I think we have two more enterprise funds with um, Mary yeah. Margaret. Yeah. And then we should go back to the um, uh, to the DPW budgets. Okay, Christine. Yeah. So I just have rec and rank left to do. Okay. Great. And Charlie, we'll the parking's done as well. Oh, parking is done. Good. We'll do that as well to get it in uh, on uh, Wednesday. Any other comments? Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Appreciate your. Uh, Charlie, we should, we should vote on the IT budget soon, next time, before people forget. Uh, that's fine. We'll uh, uh, just remind me on, um, on Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Good evening. Right, thank you. The recording.